Hey, everybody, and welcome to Product Happy Hour, where you can go to happy hour with your favorite product people in your sweatpants. We are product folks here to share what we've learned off in the hard way over great drinks. Why happy hour? Why not? It's the best way to get the inside scoop from grizzled vets with the scars to prove it. Thanks for giving us a listen. The best ways you can help us keep this party going is to head to our new Substack page and subscribe at www.producthappyhour.com. Paid subscriptions help keep ads off the show. It's either $5 a month or $30 a year. That's literally one Starbucks latte a month or one DoorDash order a year to keep this sucker going. We had a few paid subscribers over the weekend, the first ones, and to all of you from us, a huge thank you. We never thought we'd get that kind of support. It really touched us wherever we have emotions, somewhere in there. Um, Finally, please subscribe on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts for easy listening anywhere, anytime. So, Ira has been in Turkey visiting her team out there. So we thought this would be a good opportunity to record an extra special episode for y'all, our first interview. We're giving it a go as a way to ask experts in our product community questions designed to help you take your product game and career to the next level. Our guest today is a good friend of the show, Seth Hodgson. Ira and I both have learned a ton from Seth over the years, and we're excited to have him on the show to share what he's learned with all of you. So let's get into it. Here's our extra special interview with Seth. Enjoy. Really? Ask her about her cat, stupid Roger. <laughs> <laughs> I'm excited to ask about stu- stupid, stupid, stupid Roger. Roger? Okay, stupid Roger. I I was about to say stupid Roger, and I was like, well, is that offensive? You're like, wait, that's sure. not. Did I just did I misremember that? No, that's <laughs> legit. I, all right, yeah, good. stupid that's Roger, good. in Dublin, <laughs> Ireland. Yeah, it's an Very Irish nice. cat. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right, stupid Roger. I guess that's stupid a good Roger, in Ireland. All right, man. Well, well, let's just hop into it. Are you ready? Okay. Yeah, let's do it. All right, man. Well, welcome to Product Happy Hour, Seth. We're happy to have you. Thank Um, you. Yeah, man. Well, before we hop into all of the great content and just kind of pick your brain a little bit, I wanted to tell everybody here on the pod a little bit about you, man. I mean, Mm. we met kind of in the middle of your career. um, Yeah. And uh, if I get any of this wrong, just clarify, okay? Because, yeah. um, you know, I, I pulled this from LinkedIn and what I know about you, but yeah. uh, here, here we go, okay? So for everybody listening, Seth Hodgson is VP of Engineering at Udemy, an online learning platform. Seth has 20 plus years of experience working in technology at some of the world's top tech companies. He began his career in startup land in the Bay Area at the height of the dot-com bubble. You didn't cause the bubble, right? Just no, it's phone. it's funny. <laughs> I moved to San Francisco in 2001. Uh, yeah. Right, this was this was maybe at the beginning of the dot com crash. It's like when you're in a small town mm. on a tropical island, and there's a tsunami, but you don't know it, and the water starts pulling out away from the beach, and you wander down, and you're just like, this is weird. <laughs> and then and you're like, oh, oh, oh. Um, so yeah. So anyway, so I moved to like I moved to San Francisco in 2001 uh, when a lot of people yeah. were leaving. Oh, this is this is like, I feel like this is a, a, a this is a theme in my life is mm-hmm. look for counter cyclical opportunities. Oh, interesting. Right. Yeah. Kind of the buy low, that. sell high thing. Like buy yeah. high, sell low. Do it. Pays off. Yeah. That's I smart. moved up from uh, Santa Barbara, California. Santa Barbara. Okay. All right. Gotcha. All right. Cool. And you grew up in Santa Barbara, right? Or, I did. Uh, yeah. Very nice. All right. Okay. Cool. So, dot com bubble. You then ended up at Macromedia the rocket ship known as Macromedia. They're the makers of Shockwave Media Player working on content management systems. You, I don't know if everybody remembers Shockwave. I remember when I was in college, high school, I saw this little stick figure animation that kind of showed the power of Shockwave really early on. That's how old I am. I still remember that. <laughs> and I yeah. remember being like, oh my God, Shockwave. Yeah. Um, so you were there at Macromedia. And Macromedia was acquired by, by Adobe, and then you joined uh, Adobe. 
the Adobe team working for seven years on the killer of Shockwave, Flash. Flash was kind of like the the, the Flash thing. player and yeah. and the Flex SDK, which was mm -hmm. one of the first big consumer functional reactive UI toolkits. Okay. And so it was a component UI uh, toolkit with data binding and all kinds of cool stuff that uh, years later kind of found its way into web technologies with Angular and React and uh, stuff oh, like wow. that. But yeah. So a lot of the foundational stuff like for Angular, React, the kind of stuff that we're talking about now, right? Yeah, a lot of the patterns and just how you think about and design software systems. Uh, yeah. Wow. Okay. So, all right. So you're at Adobe for seven years. Then post Adobe, you joined the team at Skype, working primarily on new technology incubation. And we're still mm -hmm. 10 years away from when you join us here in Austin. So like, mm -hmm. <laughs> that's, uh, I'm looking forward to talking more about that. Post Skype and Microsoft, Seth was director of engineering at Creative Live, an online learning platform, which is probably an early sign. Of there's a theme come. here. Yeah, yeah. there's a, there's a theme. Uh, before joining us at Verbo in 2017, which is like, Dude, that's like five five years ago. That's crazy. Um, director of engineering there, which is where we met. You were responsible for the traveler consumer side of the journey, but also led efforts around instrumentation and experimentation and all the great stuff we're going to get into here in a minute. Prior to joining Udemy, where you lead uh, Udemy's active learning teams. Welcome to Happy Hour, man. Thanks. It's good to be here. I'm happy you're here. So, dude, okay. You were at Macromedia. You were on the Flash team at Adobe, worked at Skype. These are like core internet properties. Can you tell everybody a little bit about how these products fit into the larger picture of the internet? We talked a little bit about like, you know, a lot of what you were working on at Adobe being the foundational stuff for like things, yeah. that, modern technologies that we work on today, but just you know, how are these things fitting in the, in that bigger picture? Yeah, yeah, the the kind of the the creative arc of software and technology, I I think it's fascinating when you sit back and mm -hmm. ju and just like reflect on it. And it's it's just this like this constant evolutionary cycle. And so uh you know, before the before the internet as we know it, there was internet working and there were all kinds of interesting things that happened in hardware and software. But when I when I started my journey uh at Macromedia really after doing some smaller stuff in Southern California um, in yeah. 2001, the internet was, internet 1.0 was blowing up and it was uh, effectively a brand new medium, like a brand new canvas for human expression and also for human interaction. And I think that's what, those two things are what really sparked me at the beginning. And I think what uh, kept me engaged and excited and were a common theme all the way through Macromedia, Adobe, Skype, Microsoft. Uh, and that whole front block of my career, I was a, I was a developer, right? Mm -hmm. In various capacities, uh, building software systems. And the, uh, the reason to do that was, it, it wasn't, for, it's interesting because by the mid 2000s, uh, living in San Francisco from 2001 until maybe 06 when the iPhone dropped, mm -hmm. it was a really different uh, vibe or energy. And Paul Graham, who's the Y Combinator guy, did a bunch of other yeah. interesting stuff. He mm -hmm. had a book that he wrote years and years ago called Hackers and Painters, and it was about his life and story and his essays. But that notion of hackers and painters, I think, really captures the spirit uh, that that I knew in San Francisco or the Bay Area in the early 2000s. Mm -hmm. And, um, and in what way that, that it was like, in that it was just kind of a bunch of like off the wall, hack creative nut job, like hackers and painters mm -hmm. that were, and they were there, they were working at Macromedia. They were working on stuff like the flash player, like Dreamweaver, the flex SDK. They were working on that stuff, not because anyone had any expectation of, of like an IPO or being a unicorn or whatever. They were working on it because they they were just inspired and passionate about using software to create tools to let people create online yeah. and um and so i i think through all that stuff up through skype and microsoft um i got a chance to work on a lot of client side technologies server side technologies frameworks um media encoding and processing like a lot of different things that at this point looking back on it really feel like these uh, these crucial atoms that 
you know, now this chat, right? Yeah. Online is based on H.264 audio and video, right? Encoding. And like, there are all these things that got, that got stood up um, in technologies that maybe rolled over into other technologies uh, with time. Um, but what's exciting to me is that when I started out, the like the dream in my mind and a lot of the minds of the folks I was working with was wouldn't it be great if we actually had the tools and the capabilities and the and the infrastructure to do a lot of the things that now we just take for granted and so for me then the second part of my career was a shift toward um away from building the like the primitives the technical primitives toward how do we how do we actually wire these things together in a way that's increasingly useful for humans right mm. for various outcomes that i personally find value in and so yeah. like creative live that was uh ed tech um and so i'm a curious person and so and and i think like you've heard me say this before but there are so many challenges on the planet and always have yeah. been and the, the solution to them is to have more humans that mm -hmm. have growth mindset and are learners and so right. i feel like i keep getting pulled back to uh companies or efforts that have this as its core mission but creative live and then verbo which was about an unlocking travel which i think is also one of the best ways that we learn about ourselves and others uh, and now udemy um i feel like all these things have kind of like come full circle and woven together where Dude, what do you got back there by the way I, I got okay so sorry i didn't mean to interrupt I, no 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 i have uh this is they don't know it but they're my unofficial sponsor this is the Marfa <laughs> Spirit Company. Um, nice. It's Chihuahua Desert Sotol. Sotol is a, uh, it's a desert plant. Uh, it's not agave. And so it's actually not the same as Tequila Mezcal. It has a different flavor, but this is basically this is a Ploma, Sotol okay. Ploma. Very nice, very nice. I'm rocking a, what is this called? An Amber Vision from uh, Austin Beer Works. So, yeah. Sticking to beer. Uh, okay, so here, here's what we're gonna do next, okay? Um, three topic areas. Yeah. One, we'll kind of talk about the art of product management. Uh, then experimentation. A lot of what I know about experimentation, I know from you. So I'd love for the, uh, the group here, those of us listening to the pod to learn from you about that. And then instrumentation. I think you've taught me a lot about, you know, how to think about that properly. And uh, so I'd love to share that with the audience here as well. So shall we dive into PM? That sounds great, man. All right, cool, man. How are you doing on your drink? I'm good. I'm like halfway good. down, but I've also got good, good. half a beer here still. So <laughs> <laughs> I haven't given you enough of a chance to drink. So I'm gonna I'm gonna start asking you questions and then then uh, make sure you take a swig of that. Okay. From your perspective, what makes a PM a great PM? I think uh, I think that honestly. It's such a hard job. Being a PM is a, is, is a really hard job. It's not an easy job. And, um, but it also is perhaps the most high leverage job in tech in terms of the positive in, impact that a person could have on, on an effort. And the reason why I say that is that, uh, like if you're in engineering, um, there tend to be a much, much clearer uh, acceptance criteria for whether the work you're doing passes, mm. whether it's automated tests or metrics or whatever it is. Um, if you're in design, right, it's, uh, it's also maybe an easier thing to, to understand, like what is the shape of the job? What, is, what does it mean to do it well or do it poorly? Um, product management is, is, a, is a harder thing. What product management done well looks like to me is maybe an echo of what this guy, Steven Sanofsky, who was a, a PM mm -hmm. for ages at Microsoft, um, kind of a thought leader type guy. He, he talked about the, the beginning of the, the function at Microsoft. And so I think the function of product management, I'll have to check, you know, this is drunk history. This could be totally <laughs> wrong, but I think it's probably not totally wrong. It's probably just partially wrong. But mm -hmm. what Microsoft did is they created PMs. They didn't have PMs, right? When, when Bill Gates and Balmer and folks spun up and were hacking out Microsoft DOS and just, you know, whatever they were doing, um, posing for magazines on, on the top of desks and nerd clothes. They were just writing software, right? 
like early office, Excel, spreadsheet stuff. And we didn't have the internet back then. And so they had customers, but there wasn't an easy way to have a feedback loop with the customer, right? And so they, they invented this function, uh, product manager, who was basically someone that understood technically what was being built and why, and then could basically drop ship into a customer site with like a release of the software and just see how customers were using it, stuff like that, bring it back. And so I think that oftentimes um, it's easy for us to fall in love with our own inventions. And so as an engineer or for engineers, a lot of times we get lost in crafting a perfect machine. And it's like, at some point you're like, hey, tap, tap me on the shoulder. Seth, what the hell are you doing? This is actually not what the customer needs anymore. And it's, but it's almost perfect to Jay. And, uh, and design can do similar things. I, I think that the, the function of product management done incredibly well is imagine that, imagine that like there are rowers in a boat and some of them are developers, some of them are engineers, data scientists, whoever it is, specialists, and they're all rowing, maybe in slightly different directions. The customer is back at the dock and the PM is the one who like is throwing the rope back to the customer on the dock to make sure we keep the, you know, we don't like shoot off mm, yeah. into the middle of the ocean, but actually go grab the customer, make sure we take them where we, where they want to go. And I, and then I think that, and that's like very meta, but that's what product management is, is meta. It's not kind of down in the, in the weeds details, like, oh, you know, you're, you're crafting this widget with this tool. You're the coxswain on a boat, like call, like a little bit, like how do, how do we keep everyone rowing together toward the customer? Yeah. Right. And this requires, I think it requires two, two really important things that are, that, that kind of fly in the face of a lot of our human nature, which is humility and curiosity. And so the best PMs, I think, are able to um, kind of in the notion, like the notion of servant leadership or something, but kind of really find authentic ways to act in service of the customer and the rest of the team in the interest of getting everyone to a useful destination together. Yeah. Yeah, well said. I, I like your perspective. And the reason why I asked the question is because, you know, when you talk to P other PMs, we all are insiders, you know, we're, yeah. we're all kind of talking about the same things, but to hear it from an engineering leader, I think definitely you get a bit of a different perspective. Um, so you mentioned humility and curiosity. Those are, those are some pretty valuable traits in your mind. Like how, how would one develop that? Or, you know, the only way I can think about it is just you get your ass kicked enough. <laughs> you don't get it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah I, th I mean, and I, I think that, I think that it's important also, like, this is something that I've been, I've been iterating on with, with some of the folks I work with. Um, just thinking about like, what are the principles that, what are, what are kind of, what are our, what is our operating system? Like what are the principles that should be driving our actions? And um, and I think that humility and curiosity first, because if you're not humble and curious, you're not going to pay attention to reality. You're gonna you're gonna bark at reality, right? You're gonna whether reality is like the weather or your wife or your friend or your kids or whatever, you're just gonna be barking at them. And reality doesn't care, right? And isn't gonna respond to being barked at. And so you have to be humble. You have to be curious. But you also you also need to have uh, you have to have a point of view and you have to develop it and then once you develop a point of view you have to have courage and conviction uh, to drive toward that right and so I think it's this balance of of courage and conviction right to drive in a direction that you think is is valuable for reasons but then to do it with other people requires humility and curiosity to bring them along, right? Otherwise, you know, you're leading and no one's following, which is yeah. when, when you see product management done poorly, that's always what's yeah. happening. Yeah. Let's talk about poorly. What are the things that PMs do that drive you crazy or the things that PM should avoid doing? I, I think that, um, I think the trickiest thing is, and it's, it's, it's interesting because going from, you know, I spent the first big chunk of my career as a IC writing code and building systems and doing design. And then the, the, 
the second half has been in management or leadership roles. And I think in the second half of my career, the, the, the shape of the job is much more similar to product management than it was in the, in the first part of my, my career in terms of soft influence and communication and a lot of these other things being very important or critical, right? And so I think the things that, the things that PMs do uh, that drive me crazy are not things that PMs do that drive me crazy, but things that anyone in a position of authority or decision-making do that drive you crazy. So like, mm. look at the US Senate, and what are actions that they do that drive you crazy versus actions where you're like, hell yeah, right? Let's actually pass a bill that starts to put money toward climate change research. Um, and so I think that, I think it's really not complicated. I think that the things that PMs do that drive me crazy or any leader are when they're making, when they're acting in ways that are clearly out of sync with reality right where the everyone around them is just like mm -hmm. this is a terrible decision <laughs> what mm -hmm. um and they're not humble and curious or not willing to see it um uh or when and this this goes back to a value that we have uh here at udemy individually humble collectively proud when um when their actions and decisions are, are clearly not in service of the collective and so an example that, that happens a little bit more for PMs than it does for other functions is um, I need resources mm -hmm. I hear that. to execute my vision. Mm -hmm. I need more resources. And, um, and uh, you know, sharecropping, it reminds me of sharecropping, like with the, with like the, you know, the, what's that? What is your, Sharecropping is like you you have like the feudal lord or the landholder, right? Oh yeah, and, yeah. Okay, and you're yeah, it, right. you have this. You, it's like I need more plebeians. I need more serfs on my plot to farm potatoes for me, right? Yeah. And 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 the the people are like, <laughs> why should I farm potatoes for you? Potatoes are not even the right crop to be farming, you know. And it's like that that drives me crazy when when mm. you have and and the thing that's tricky is that get more people to farm the wrong thing. Yeah, which is which again is kind of like an example of bad product management is having too many people connected to a product manager working on the wrong things for the wrong reasons, mm -hmm. right? And that's what mm -hmm. causes companies to fail. And um, and so I think as a product manager, it's it's real hard. You can do great good or you can kill your company, right? Totally. It's something you meant. You know, you make me think of how when you have a great strategy when you've really pointed yourself at something valuable and you can see where the return on investment is high from yeah. a strategic perspective or for users or whatever. It's yeah. funny how resources, energy, motivation, momentum kind just of gets attracted to that. Yeah. It comes well, very, that, that's, you know, that's, you know, one of the things that, in engineering, when we were at Verbo, one of the concepts that folks talked about was wake, was wake for leaders or for, you know, lead tech leads or things like that. And you think about same thing with sports teams, like any sort of group effort with multiple humans. And you can you can think about what is the wake that someone is is leaving behind, right? And um, some some wake is just gravitational, like you're saying where yeah. it's like the 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 logic and the the data support and evidence for a, a given direction and strategy and in the mission it, it just and so what's interesting is oftentimes and this kind of goes back to like um i don't believe that location is as important as just showing up and being with your team wherever that happens to be and if that happens your team's going to do amazing amazing work um in a similar fashion like one of the best ways to to spot pms that are not effective is that they're managing up and asking senior leadership for more resources mm -hmm. and it's like if you actually were effective you wouldn't have to ask for this mm. it'd be happening very very good takeaway very interesting i i agree with that 
And I think with with conditions, right? With conditions, yeah. that's that's an absolute. Yeah, it's it's hyperbole a little bit, but I there, there's there's like you said, there's truth to it. And it's like, um, it's like if if you're if you're a PM that that is in it to do amazing things for the customer with it with a team from start to finish, you're going to have engineering peers and design peers and product peers and customer support peers and everyone that are like. We're in this with you. Let's win this together. Yeah, hundred percent. So, let's recap the PM stuff. What are the kinds of skills and knowledge that you would recommend PMs to acquire early on in their careers to help them get a leg up? I think uh, this could be my engineering bias. Okay, but I think that digital digital products. Um, I think that PMs probably do themselves more good than harm by getting curious and into the weeds with technical uh, aspects of what's happening, whether that's dabbling in code or dabbling in, in data analytics or, or even just like really getting into and trying to understand and, and thought experiment and brainstorm what's happening in given ecosystems like native or AIML or whatever it is. And um, you don't have to, you don't have to be the the world expert on that stuff, but you have to, and this goes back to the 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 principle of curiosity, is it's like the more curious you are about the technical realities of of what your digital product is based on, um, the better a partner you will be to your engineers and designers. And the the more engaged and supportive they will be of you and your vision. And I, I think oftentimes what I see is from my point of view is kind of a surprising lack of curiosity about the reality of the things that they want to build where it's like, oh no, 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 no. I just have this sketch on a napkin and you know I have some offshore developers and they're just gonna figure it all out. That doesn't lead to an amazing digital product, mm. full stop. You know, so yeah. I think that, and I think that this isn't something that you just, need to do when you're starting out, but it's something that I think Ajay does, something I do. Like it's something that we do all the way through. And the sooner you start to exercise that muscle, the better off you'll be, right? It's like exercise. It's like, oh, I'm gonna get I'm gonna start to get curious about this tech stuff later. I have a presentation to work on. I have a pitch to the board. And it's like there's always going to be a million reasons not to be curious about what the thing you're building is and how it actually works and the less energy you put into that we most of the reasons that we fail or, or as teams we fail or as companies we fail is because we just don't do the obvious real work that we need to do to understand the thing we're building totally man you're yeah you're hitting on a few things that i feel like uh, even are inspiring me. Cause I feel like sometimes you get lost in, like you said, pitch decks and whatever, which and are important. I mean, that stuff's important. This sort of stuff. Yeah. But it's a it balance, right? But, right. You have to balance. So, so to summarize, be humble, be curious, um, be a great get team. To, get technical, get technical. Uh, I like the technical one. I was just talking. I was just talking to somebody the other day that I've been uh, that I've been coaching new on, new on the team. We yeah. were talking about like, you know, do we really need to div, dive in, dive into all of web development? And it's like, you don't need to, but you'd be a lot better if you did. <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, you'd, you'd be a lot better if you did. Like, you don't yeah. have to. It's like, you don't have to do it all yourself. That's why we're a team. But. Um, we're also, we're, we're a team. It's not transactional. It's not like I put my, my PRD in a vacuum tube and it goes to the engineering department and they type, so, you know what I mean? It's like, we're, yeah, totally. it's like put yourself in a position where you can have the good conversations. It's the other surprising how it's something that comes up often where people are like, Oh, I write the PRD. It's like office space. Oh, I like take the documentation. I run across the thing to the engineers. Why don't the engineers talk to customers? Because well, I'm a people person, damn. <laughs> right. Well, it's it's yeah. funny too because it's, not the, the, that way. it's it like really with any of our roles, it's really easy for us to get um, to almost weaponize our role and get into a get into a set of actions 
where we don't have to be curious or learn, right? Where it's like, oh no, I'm doing the PRD checkbox and then I'm an engineer. And it's like, oh no, I'm moving my Jira tickets through these lanes. And it's like, but what are we doing for the customer? Like, how is the product working? And no one knows, yeah. right? And so I, I think that's the key thing. The other thing that just occurred to me that I think is super important all the way through, but especially when you're starting out as, as a, a product manager, um, is that the energy that you like just your energy how you how you interact with the team um, it's uh, emotion is contagious right this is like shown through psychological research right negativity spreads ep epidemically positivity spreads ep ep epidemically and so as a product manager I think the other thing to do is um, in interactions with the team uh, you know, authentically, you can't fake it all the time, but really do try to emphasize a positive, um, resilient attitude, right? And there's not there's not a right way to do it. Everyone does it different, but that's so important. And no team is going to be effective with a crabby ass PM. <laughs> it's true. It's amazing how much being cool, calm, collected, and being positive optimistic but not um employing not foolish, a, right not foolish not employing a reality distortion field yeah um can get you it can get you very 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 far and the best teams that i've worked on are ones that are like okay this is hard but you know yeah. we can get there we can do this we have the tools that we need uh, through experimentation and instrumentation, which is what we're going to talk about next, and um, yeah. and other critical tools, user research and stuff, to help yeah. us get there. But we will get there. The other thing is, if you're if you're a product manager or in a leadership position, most of like, no matter what, like you're going to have to make calls on things. You're going to have to decide things, mm -hmm. and those things are oftentimes not going to. You're you're not going to be in a position where you have full consensus on an outcome if it's interesting or if it matters, they're just, you won't. Um, and that's hard. It's hard emotionally. Mm -hmm. Like I think for a lot, like, like me, I think a lot of people go into engineering because we're like, Oh, <laughs> that's so hard. I'm going to avoid it. I'm just going to, you know, this, <laughs> this keyboard doesn't tell me I'm a bad person. Um, and so, so I think that also the, an important thing, especially when you're starting out as a PM, um, and again, you need this all the way through, but I think it's important when you're starting out because you don't yet have, you haven't yet really gotten to the point where you understand your limits and where you break and where you don't and things like that. And uh, and you're gonna hit your limits. Like you're gonna be in a meeting and you will have had a busy day and you'll be at your limit and someone will say something and like from experience, you'll say things where like later you're like, that was not the right thing to say. and yeah. um, and so I think it's also real important, especially important as a PM when you're starting out to, uh, to find um, self-care. And so whether that's diet, exercise, like all the standard things, but also most critically, um, a safe place for you to just process and unpack what you're learning about yourself and your team and how to, how to coordinate work and all these hard emotions. And that could be finding a more senior PM like a J, someone that could mentor you or coach you it could be finding someone that you just like like you know life coach like work coach type person you hop on the phone with once a month i i think that that sort of uh that sort of investment is worth its weight in gold and probably not enough people take advantage of it yeah i do find self-care for me in the form of medication, me uh, not medication, not medication, uh, meditation, yeah, liquid medication. <laughs> uh, cheers, man. Um, meditation and physical exercise to be really, really helpful. Me too. Um, me too. And, um, it's funny you would, so I, just to, you know, kind of summarize some of the things you were talking about in this, this area, I do find product management and leadership to be very connected at the hip. Like, Yep. You are a leader on the team. You talked about being a team captain on a yep. boat uh, or the coxswain on the boat. I do think that is a very, very, very 
uh, accurate analogy for PM. We talk about it in episode four when we're talking about what is product management. Yeah. You know, we think about it more in terms of being a team captain instead of, you know, being CEO where you just tell everybody what to do. And that's yeah. what a lot of people think of, but it's much more like that. And uh, yeah, the idea of self care, you're really doing it for your customers and for your team. Cause if you're not in a good place, then you can't be there for your team and your customer. You yeah. Yeah. You're never really completely there. Yeah. Okay, man, let's shift into two topics that I know you're super, super passionate about. Yeah, man. Experimentation. And Texas and... history. <laughs> <laughs> Data analysis. We can talk about <laughs> Texas history at the end. We'll talk I'll about just that pull later. That on. I'll pull that on as a bonus episode. Um, yeah. Okay. So when we met, yeah. experimentation, I think this kind of ladders up into the curiosity thing that you talked about. Because yeah. these two sets of concepts and tools are really, really critical for kind of chipping away at what you want to or need to know about your customer, your business, how things work, really work, not just how you think things work or your boss yeah. or your leadership team thinks how, how things work. So I think they're really, really critical for, uh, for trying to understand that. Let's start with experimentation why don't we give listeners kind of like a five minute primer from your perspective on experimentation? I know it's a, con- I mean, yeah, it's, really complicated, it's, it's a big but topic, but yeah. it's, but it, it, it's let's a try. big topic, but like the, 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 the essence is not that big. And so, um, I think this is that, why I want you to do it because yeah. when I learned from you on the topic, it was like, Oh shit, it's not that go. I mean, it's complicated, but it's not that complicated. But It's really not that complicated. Yeah. And so the, uh, like if we, if we think back to life in the dark ages, it was pretty grim. And, uh, thankfully we moved past that. And what moved us past that was the enlightenment and kind of like the rediscovery of, of the scientific method. And the scientific method is that we observe our reality and we, we don't assume that we're trapped in it or that it's fixed but that it's, it's, it's a system or a machine that we can understand and we can influence. And so the scientific method says, observe your reality, make some observations about something you care about. Like, oh, I actually don't need to get a new bottle of Sotol. Uh, I'm good for now, right? We make an observation. And then once we make an observation, um, maybe we have some questions. Like, how much of that bottle of Sotol should I drink before I go get another bottle? Um, and then once you've once you've asked the question, you can start to do research into what types of things might answer that question. Like what might you need to measure? What might what might you need to understand to to answer that question? And then once you have uh, once you have the research done, you can build a hypothesis where basically you say, okay, well I've observed X, and I have a question about why why this, and I've done some research, and I think that if I measure this part of the system and change this thing, I can understand whether or not this thing is happening because of this other thing. Mm -hmm. And so you run your experiment and you observe the results. And if the results confirm your hypothesis, then you update your model of reality, right? You're like, oh, you know what? I didn't know why this cause led to this effect. And now I understand it's at least in part because of this, this aspect. And, uh, and you, you can just repeat the loop. And so what that let us do is it let us um, like stop sacrificing animals on altars <laughs> if, uh, if it wasn't raining on our crops or whatever, right? So th- thank, thank, thank our lucky stars for that. Okay, <laughs> so scientific method. So um, this is still kind of at a far remove from online controlled experimentation that we do in software systems today. So fast forward up to like the early 1900s, this guy, Sir Ronald Fisher in, uh, in the UK, uh, just this polymath, brilliant statistician, biologist, all these things. Um, he was doing research into, into genetics and other things, these crop studies. And he started, he came up with a statistical way to look at outcomes for different groups of crops that were, um, put through different treatments, say of like a different type of soil or a different type of fertilizer or whatever. And, um, and he came up with statistical ways to reason about the variance in the outcomes to infer back 
uh, to the cause, to the hypothesized cause, and uh, and get a handle on um, on kind of the the strength of of evidence that this is actually the cause, as opposed to just a random uh, a random effect that you observed. And so that's really cool, and that that fundamentally transformed science. Um, and uh, so, and that, that's called um, analysis of variance, uh, um, statistical powers that like, uh, and so you have different groups and they, you put them through different treatments. And then when you look at the observed outcome for the different groups, you can measure the kind of the variance in each group and the, you can find the mean or the center of the outcome for each of the groups and then understand if those means are different, um, how different do they need to be for us to treat that as believable evidence that the treatment for the group that is significantly different from control is likely due to a real effect rather than just random chance. And so we're going along and science is working and we're doing all these things like creating the internet. And then, um, and then, uh, and then the internet's created and there are all these people on it, thanks to the Flash player, watching YouTube videos. And YouTube's like, we really need to increase the number, the, the number of minutes watched for kids on YouTube. How do we do this? Well, we should start doing online controlled experiments. And this is a little bit drunk history. It probably wasn't just <laughs> YouTube, although they were one of the chief offenders. But what happens, what's interesting is what happens is that you can imagine uh, my undergraduate studies were in uh, biochemistry, molecular biology. And if you're doing experiments, uh, genetic experiments, um, DNA experiments, you're basically having, at least 25 years ago or 30 years ago, you were having to actually, um, <laughs> you had to grow bacteria. Yeah. Right? And you had to wait for bacteria to grow, Different which game. takes time. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, and then see, and then you break the bacteria up, you analyze your DNA, you do things and you're like, okay, this, this worked or it didn't work. And it takes a ton of time. What's interesting, and same with the crop studies that Fisher did, you have to wait for, how long did it take for plants to grow and for months, fruit to, years. right? Months, a long time. So it's very slow feedback cycle. Um, introduce the internet and, uh, you know, social feeds and all like, all like, um, you know, very fast feedback loops of user interactions with online systems. And what you can do is that you can run controlled experiments in the same fashion where you have a control group, you have other groups that, uh, that are getting different treatments. You randomize assignment of your, your folks that are part of the experiment um, explicitly or implicitly across those groups. And you do statistical analysis of whether the differences are material or not. Um, this is incredibly powerful and, and really, you know, Duolingo, they just had like a, a 70%, you know, year over year, like they've had amazing, uh, results in terms of subscriber growth and learning outcomes on Duolingo. And they're running a huge number of online controlled experiments. Every, every company that is actually, uh, pivoting and moving their product toward what works better for their customers is doing so with online controlled experiments. Got it. Perfect. We went a little over five minutes, but it's perfect. Um, what are the sort of traditional methods that you see in terms of online controlled experiments? Um, you know, I think when you and I met, we were really into Bayesian techniques. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's null hypothesis testing. Maybe let's give the crew uh, a summary of those two methods and, you know, maybe a summary of the pros and cons of each. Yeah, so there's, in statistics, there's kind of two camps. And one camp is uh, referred to as frequentist, uh, which is where Ron Fisher uh, started us out. And then the other camp is uh, is Bayesian. And in, in frequentist or null hypothesis controlled experiment experimentation, what you do is you say, we have a control group, we have another group that's getting an alternate treatment, we're going to measure the difference in their outcomes, and we're going to make a hypothesis 
the null hypothesis that the treatment that we've presented to this alternate group actually has no effect. We're gonna we're gonna assume it has no effect, and we're gonna we're gonna try to using using contradiction. We're gonna say if we actually detect what looks like a statistically significant difference in outcome, we can then say well the outcomes are different enough that that disproves our hypothesis that our treatment had no effect. And so then we can say our treatment had an effect um, based on the observed difference. And so that's, that's called frequentist statistics. And this is, this is what a lot of, um, okay, this is kind of the safe way to do online controlled experimentation. Because when you, when you run such an experiment, you're not assuming any prior knowledge Right? Mm -hmm. You're just saying, I don't know anything about how much effect this could or could not have. We're just going to give it to these two groups. We're going to assume it has no effect, and we're going to look for a statistical difference big enough for us to disprove our hypothesis. Um, Bayesian statistics, on the other hand, is based on the notion of a prior knowledge. And so uh, I know a J, right? And I know that he does drink beer. And so when I see him pick up the glass in front of me on the video, um, I have prior knowledge. And so he might not have beer in that glass, but based on Bayesian statistics, I could actually assign a probability that it is beer, right? <laughs> and it is. And so the thing about Bayesian statistics that is appealing is that, um, with frequentist statistics, if you assume that the treatment that you're applying has no effect and you have no prior knowledge about what amount of effect it could have, you have to, to determine a, a, a statistically significant difference in outcomes, you have to collect a certain number of samples, which can be a lot of samples. And so the, the thing that's appealing about Bayesian is that if you can assume prior knowledge that is accurate, um, what you can do is you can start to make inferences that require fewer samples uh, to get to a point where you you believe the outcome. Um, I think that if you have uh, really amazing in-house folks, Bayesian is probably a preferable approach, especially if you have a back window of good analytics and data and you know how metrics are moving, what their standard variances are, how much of an effect a certain type of experiment should have on a metric you can do Bayesian analysis. If you don't know those things, you're best off going the frequentist route um, because complicated mathematical models uh, give you certain outcomes. They're complicated. <laughs> they give you certain outcomes, yeah. but only if the, the preconditions and constraints are respected. And so if you, if you don't respect those, the outcome that you get from a, a, an experiment is actually not, not useful. Mm -hmm. And so it's important to, like, we don't have to go into all the, I've already gone into too many details here, but the, the no, gist no, of it no. is, is really that um, when you're doing experimentation, uh, you're way better off in terms of making changes to the product that are actually cause, like causally better than randomly better. Um, you're better off doing those experiments gated, like you're better off evolving your product gated on experiments, but you should do so in a way that respects the framework of the experimentation style that you're using rather than trying to, uh, to cheat. Yeah, these are excellent points. I, I, when we met, we were using, you know, the team that I was on was using a Bayesian framework. And I think when we started discussing Bayesian in more detail and frequentist in more detail. And you started covering like, Hey, a prior is like, not just like you fill in a number and you kind of move on. There's a pretty robust statistical model behind establishing that prior. Um, and you really, really need to have strong data chops in order to establish that well, so you don't get the wrong output out of your experiments. Yeah. I was like, oh shit. Yeah, this is like way more complicated than what we've been doing. It's like, you know, yeah. I, and I think this can be this this kind of leads into the pitfalls section. So I want to talk more about this in detail, but you know, it can be easy to look for ways out or shortcuts with experimentation, which is a lot of ways what we were doing. 
and at that time and it's not so easy to stick to you know the rules quote unquote um or, or actually the actual scientific rules and just do it properly yeah. uh whichever method you're you're using um do you find that a lot and then let's pivot into the pitfalls like kind of what are the two or three pitfalls that you that are the most common that you see with teams but that are trying to experiment yeah i think um i th i think yes i think that i think i think most companies um experimentation win rates are probably somewhat inflated um but but like pitfalls so i think the pitfall really is the same pitfall that you have regardless like it doesn't matter what framework you're using the here's the pitfall with experimentation is or really with just product development in general is that as we're building a digital product or building anything um it's a loop right where you 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 set out and you're like okay we we want to build toward some target some goal and you go that way and you hit a, a part of it that you don't understand or that's not working and you can just push through and ignore it or run a fake experiment or have a vanity metric and just keep going or you can actually try to unpack and understand what's happening right and mitigate it solve it whatever and and keep doing that and so i think that i i think the pitfall with experimentation is is when it's not being used to really be curious and understand why things are working and it becomes more just a um you know, a vanity metric, basically like it, it, like a, a slot machine poll where it's like, uh, it's like, oh, look, I got three cherries. It's green in the dashboard or it's red in the dashboard. And the team doesn't stop and, and kind of unpack it and say like, well, does this align with our hypothesis? Does what are users doing? Is it, does this actually make sense? Um, and I think that there, so I think that there is just, uh, I mean, this goes back to human nature and the fact that we're we are curious, but we're also lazy. Um, you know, it, we we want to, some part of us wants to just show up at work and not actually have to do any hard work and just pull the lever and have it show green and be able to like, you know, be in the success Celebrate theater, yeah, right? right? So that's the that's the big hazard. And it really has nothing to do with the specific framework or the tools or any of the rest of it. It really is just about, Ex like experimentation done right is about um, is about being the most effective way to actually ask and answer questions about our users yeah. and get real answers. Because the other thing that's interesting is like for for us or for anyone, what people say and what they do. There's there's a reason why we have this saying: actions speak louder than words. And right. so we could we could do UX UXR. We could do research with customers. We could do surveys. We could do all these things, right? And people are going to say, oh, I want X, I, I want things to work like this, which is good. And we should do that. But that is no substitute for actually measuring what they actually do, right? Because totally. it's not a thought experiment. It's like, what are they actually doing? Because the way that we, the way that we build a feature might actually not be at all what was in the customer's mind when we described the capability to them, right? Mm -hmm. And so, yeah. um, so I think that's the, that's the hazard is turning it into a, uh, a shortcut or a way to avoid understanding the customer rather than actually a tool to understand the customer. A hundred percent. I do want to unpack that a bit um, because when you're talking about people being very focused on, is it green? Is it red? Or, you know, to put yeah. it more uh, holistically, is it successful or not? Yeah. And that's the only thing that you're interested in. Uh, sometimes that leads to some common patterns that we've talked about. One is not giving the experiment enough time to run, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so you look at things like minimal detectable effect or MDE, yeah. and then the required amount of traffic or something yeah. like that to register properly. Um, people tend to see something green, not, run it for the appropriate amount of time for the MD in question and then just, you yeah. know, accept the result and roll it out instead of thinking harder about what 
kind of statistics are related to that. Yeah. Or we were talking about the prior earlier, shortcutting the uh, prior process and yeah. just setting some random prior that yeah. you think represents what you mean instead right. of really spending the time to define it, understanding that process and how it impacts your results. Those are all coming out of that, that core concept of, exactly. I'm just going to shortcut this thing to get the result that I need. Exactly. This is the tricky thing in, in any system or process, right? We, we put processes and systems in place uh, to act as guardrails to encourage us to do the work, but, um, but we're very creative and people game it, right? And so that that's it's yeah all those things it's a tricky thing. That's not yeah, a reason not to have the process and guardrails, right? It, but it it is like it's uh, just just having the process and the guardrails isn't enough. We have like we have to hold ourselves and our teams to a high standard. Uh, yeah, and I, I mean p hacking was a really popular thing for a long time. I'm sure you lived through that. I did too. Where yep. everybody's like, oh, you just gotta. That's what you gotta get into, man. But um what you start realizing is that uh, most of that is garbage too. Um, and, and maybe just to recap some of those terms that we were using MDE time to run. Uh, those are all kind of frequentist stuff. And then um, yeah. that's minimal detectable effect. And maybe, maybe it might be helpful to just kind of walk people through that concept. Like what is that minimal detectable effect? How does it relate to how long you should run an experiment? What are the yeah. things people should look out for? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what's interesting with minimal detectable effect is um, if if you talk about if you t like what is the significant difference, right? Just thought thought question for for anyone. Like if if you if you have a bunch of samples, right, from one population and a bunch of samples from another population, and you you take the distribution of those samples, you're going to get two curves, right? And the center of those curves is uh, is if there is a difference between those groups, the center of the curves is going to be different. And so like, and you could think like, I, I have I have a kiddo in, in fifth grade right now. And so like, there's four fifth grade classes in her school. And so we could say, okay, standardized math test, right? What's the average score in, in class one, two, three, four, five? And uh, let's let's assume the kids are are just randomly distributed, and they were and each of the classes was given different AI math instruction, right? So you take like the human factor out of instructing. If one of those, if if like three of the classes are all basically the same average score, and one of the classes is is like lower or higher, um, how much lower or higher is significant? And so there's there's a notion in um, well, in frequentist statistics, to detect a difference that is statistically significant, you can detect a very small difference that is statistically significant, um, but it takes a huge number of samples. If it's a if it's a big difference, you can get to a statistically significant uh, result with a much smaller number of samples. Now. The number of samples you need is based on this this notion of what Ajay you just mentioned, minimum detectable effect. And so, there in frequency statistics, there's a notion of uh, practical significance and statistical significance. And so, practical significance basically is saying, you know what, there's 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 some minimum difference that we care about, and anything smaller than that. We just don't care. So for like, for instance, let's say we have, again, we have these fifth grade math classes and we're like, we want, we want the kiddos to get, uh, if, if they get 10 points higher on average on the math test, that matters because the next school over that's getting more funding is 10 points higher than us. But if they get two or three points higher, who cares? We're, we're, it doesn't even matter. Practically, it doesn't matter. And so we can say, you know what? The minimum detectable effect that we care about is plus or minus 10 points. And if you do that, then you can get a statistically significant read for your experiment with much fewer samples than if the minimum detectable effect was very small. And, and so this is something where most people that are doing 
frequency-based online controlled experimentation are oftentimes looking at like a p-value or something like that, but they're, they're not even paying attention to what is a practical significance difference. And if they define that up front, they actually could run experiments much faster. Mm -hmm. Right. And something else I see often, you're to yeah, 100%, appreciate the summary. The other thing I see often is people don't run experiments for the appropriate amount of time to evaluate properly the minimal detectable effects that they're looking for. That's what you and I talked a lot about when you first joined at Verbo is like, yeah, oftentimes we were running experiments for like two weeks when really we should have been running them for like six weeks or eight weeks. That's um, right. Cause we were looking for very lot. small differences. Right. But unless yeah. you, unless you change the MDE, you do have to, and there's a whole calculator on that. Um, yeah. If you're curious to learn more about that, you know, there's some calculators that we can recommend, like Evan Miller. I'm, I'll put some in the show notes for people that are curious. Um, for people that are starting out with experimentation, PMs, yeah. what are some of the best resources you've seen to learn more about experimentation? What advice would you give PMs just starting out with, with experimentation? So I Maybe think... Maybe we could start at the end and work backwards. Yeah, well, I, I actually think it's it's... Maybe again here, it's kind of the same answer for everyone. Um, I think the best, the best resource right now that I'm aware of is. You got it. This, Show it. Is this book? Yeah, that book, man. Best book. And I'll put a link in the show notes for everybody. Yeah, I, I, I keep this book close to me at all to, at all times. Um, I'm always running social and psychological anthropological experiments with my wife, <laughs> with my kiddos. Uh, no, but I love that the, you admitted that to everybody. The, <laughs> <laughs> but the 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 book is the book is really wonderful, and it's it's also quite it's it's quite short, and it's it's split up into different sections. Some of the sections are about um, uh, experimentation culture, right? Just as 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 a product development uh, group, um, how can you start to shift how you build digital products so that experimentation is a core part of that? Uh, some of it is about um, functionally doing the analysis if that's something you need to do and you're not using an existing platform like optimizely uh, and then some of it is about um, separate from the analysis how might you go about building out uh, components for an in-house experimentation platform um, but it's it's a great book and it's by this guy ronnie kohabi who was uh he was actually head of the experimentation group at microsoft when i was at skype at microsoft um, that's where I was actually introduced to online controlled experimentations at scale mm -hmm. and uh, learned a ton. Yeah. Yes, that's, that's the resource. And then I, I also, I also think that, um, you know, if you're, if you're a smaller company, just starting out using a service like Optimizely that has a stats engine that is tuned to do, um, you know, kind of like air rate corrections and preventing you from peaking or doing this stuff wrong is totally worth it. Mm. And if you're at a company that is investing in an in-house experimentation platform, reading this book is going to put you in a position where you can have really wonderful, uh, meaningful, grounded discussions with, with your collaborators on that team. It's a great book. You recommended it. I read it when I first joined Udemy and yeah. I really wish I'd read it like 10 years ago. <laughs> but, he didn't write uh, it 10 years ago is the problem. Oh, I, okay. All right. I, good. I, I, I sent Ronnie. Good, I, don't feel I was so bad. like, I was like, you gotta, you gotta go talk to, you gotta go talk to someone to get that time machine. So you can go back and you can publish yeah, this before 2020. Yeah. That book is phenomenal. Did he publish it in 2020? 2020, man. Wild. Okay, great. Yeah. Oh, that's like, it's a great book. Highly. It highly really is. Recommend it. All right, man. We're in the home stretch. I'm glad because I'm getting kind of drunk. Uh, let's get. <laughs> let's talk about our final topic: instrumentation. Similar to the experimentation topic, maybe give everybody a five minute primer or less, depending on or more, yeah. depending on what we cover on instrumentation, what it is, why it's important. This is this is something that I think is um, actually the key thing that I am always looking for in interviews with PMs is their, their point of view and principles and philosophy and experience on how they approach this. 
I think that if, like if a Jay and I, if we started up a corner store, uh, like if, if you move back over to Crestview, right, and we took over Little Deli and we were making pizzas and sandwiches and had all the folks in the neighborhood out. Um, Sounds like the dream. It's the dream. We would, we would be watching our customers and we would see what was happening and we'd pay attention and we would change our business based on what we were observing about the customers according to the scientific method, maybe not rigorously, but that's what we would be doing. Um, what I think is really interesting is with digital products, it can be on the one hand, so incredibly easy to understand what customers are doing, but it is so easy to not care and not pay attention in a way that just doesn't work in real life right, with face-to-face -face customer service interactions. And so I think it's, it's a fascinating tension. And I think that a lot of digital products work as well as they do, um, almost in spite of them not caring about the customer mm -hmm. at all, or paying attention to the customer at all. Because the economies of scale and the efficiencies are so great that you can basically not even understand your customer at all and still make it enough. Um, but I think there's so much upside. And I think that product managers, when when you're thinking about the digital product that you're creating, what you're, what you're creating is you're creating a software reification of a cause effect flow, where the user is going to be interacting with things in your platform that are represented as software, right? Whether it's like a driver in, the, in, in an Uber app or a playlist in Spotify, whatever it is, right? The things in your platform are rep represented as software entities and they're presented through various UIs in native and web apps and voice apps or whatever. And users are gonna interact with that in these cause effect flows that take them from the beginning of needing some outcome to having achieved that outcome, right? Mm -hmm. And how do you know if that's happening? And this used to be really mysterious. And so when I started off in, uh, in software, I was working on tools that got burned onto CDs and shipped to customers or purchased at stores and run on computers. And you had no way to know what was happening for your customers, like none. Um, that's not the world we live in anymore. And so we, mm -hmm. we actually can be different. And so at this point, um, we live in a world where we actually can instrument and understand meaningful user interactions in the product. And uh, God, it's so important. I can't emphasize how important it is. It's more important than anything. But strangely, at almost every company I've been at and every company I know people at, um, it doesn't happen mm. to, yeah. the, to the degree that it could. It's really, it's, it's mysterious to me. I think it's um, it is a mysterious thing, and I do. Uh, first, first of all, I think that summary of of it is is really good. You're you're trying to find representations digitally of things in the real world, real people, real you know actions happening on uh, on the platform in in your product, mm -hmm. and we used to be able to do that in person. Now you know we we need tools like this uh like instrumentation and, and everything that follows to better understand that i think is really elegant the um the question around like well why don't why don't other companies do this very well why don't lots of companies do this very well um i i think it comes back to what you were talking about earlier where companies have success sometimes in spite of themselves yeah. And um, there isn't a need to dive deeper into it. I found that it's when things start to slow down or you have a real problem that you don't yeah. understand um, or, you know, uh, there's like a fairly major disaster uh, for things that you're building or shipping. That's yeah. when, you know, Data, people start to care. Instrumentation, yeah, people start to care about it. Um, I don't know what your experience is with that, but that that seems to be when it happens. I think it's true, and I think you know, in support of that, through my career, the places where I where I saw it done better were in in products where 
like the, the first place I saw it done pretty to a pretty outstanding degree was at Skype and Microsoft. And Skype had billions of users, right? And so you couldn't understand how things were working or why by talking to 20 people. Um, and so you actually, you were forced to instrument and understand what mm -hmm. people were mm -hmm. actually doing, right? To right. make any sort of inference about what's working, what's not working. And, uh, and Skype also, when I first started working there was, uh, was a peer to peer application. And so that, that added a, a whole other layer of complication in terms of what calls are working, what chats are working, what's not working. And, and so you had to have instrumentation. Um, and then a, a company since then, it's been, it's been kind of like peaks and valleys, but I think the companies that I don't think I know the companies that are doing best are doing this better than most other companies. Yeah. I like because you otherwise you're just it's... getting lucky. Yeah, hundred percent. I like the way you put it too, because it's you're never done. Um, okay, yeah, this is this is super great. You uh, spent a lot of time educating us about event storming. Let's talk about event storming. What is it? Why is it useful? I th I think what's interesting is understanding the customer journey and what they're doing through the product is a horizontal problem. And oftentimes that breaks in the face of our internal organization structure in, inside of companies. And so a lot of companies optimize for the comfort and convenience of their employees over a great customer experience. And so I would much rather just keep showing up and working on the same little bit of code day after day after day or not working on it. Um, and not have to learn a bunch of different things and debug other, th other, you know, and be all over the place. And so there's this thing called Conway's law, which is uh, this observation that uh, the way that products are delivered often are a mirror of the organization structure rather than what the customer needs. And, and so one of the things that I've run into repeatedly is when I want to understand the customer journey, right? Like me and Ajay, we come to Verbo. We're trying to book a trip together with our families. We're set. We set up a trip board together to add properties to and vote on and stuff like this. Um, for us as customers, it's this. It's this whole flow, start to finish, that is walking across UI components or core services that are owned or maintained by a bunch of different teams inside of the company. And uh, some of those teams might have done a little bit of instrumentation. Some of them haven't. And so for me to understand what's happening for the customer journey um, at most companies is kind of impossible. You know, I could talk to product manager Fu or product manager Bar, and they could tell me about their pet metric. That's just one little bit of the customer journey, but no one actually knows what's happening end to end, which is unfortunate. Um, it's like the parable with the elephant where you, yeah, somebody's yeah. got a trunk, somebody's got the leg, totally. nobody sees the whole elephant. Totally, totally. And so, so I was, and this, this is when Jay and I were working at Verbo, um, we were really wrestling with how do we get, uh, how do we get product management as a function across the product managers involved and design as a function across the designers involved and engineering and data science across the, the teams involved. How do we get everyone just loosely on the same page about what the hell is the customer flow and what are the key interactions that have to happen in what order uh, to know if the thing we're building is working right or not. And a lot of companies will have a very laggy final metric at the end of a, of a funnel of some sort, but um, that oftentimes is too slow or doesn't let you decompose and understand which part of the flow is actually causing trouble or which part of the flow is the big opportunity. And so we kind of organically landed on a process for doing this and we were, we were sharing about it in in a get together in all hands at, at a Verbo at the time. And one of our uh, chief architects came up afterwards and was like, Hey, you're talking about event storming. And I was like, what? <laughs> and he's like, sounds just like event storming. So it was, uh, and what I think is interesting is like logical ways to do things. Um, oftentimes are, you know, folks settle onto them 
through a bunch of different paths because it just makes sense. So anyways, event storming is, is where you say, okay, we want to model a cause effect flow in our product where uh, a user does an action and then our system responds in some way. And maybe that could be a response in a client application. Maybe it could be a service response or some combination of the two. But if you think about your interaction, you as a human interacting with an application, whether it's Verbo or Udemy or Duolingo or Uber or whatever, it's a series of cause effect chain where you do a thing, the system, the machine responds, and then you do another mm -hmm. thing and it responds. And so you can map out that cause effect chain uh, back in the old days with uh, specific colored post-its in a left to right flow. And that, and what's, but what's beautiful about it is what you're doing is you're mapping out user actions, system reactions, but then critically, what are the facts along the way that you actually want to measure as meaningful events? And, uh, and, and then that's what gives the whole team a very simple shared language to, to reason about what is the product flow and what are the key things that we want to measure that are happening, such as Seth launching a lab or a Jape uh, adding Seth to a trip board or whatever it is. And once you have those, those raw events that matter in your product flows, you're unlocked to do funnel analysis, journey analysis, sand key analysis, experimentation, all these other things become possible. And your, your, your whole product organization and marketing and finance and IT and everyone else in the company has a very simple map and artifact to understand what the product's doing that's not getting into crazy technical jargon or design jargon or business jargon. It's really a wonderful process. It really gets everybody involved because you're kind of doing with stickies and and trying to better understand the full journey. You know, as a group collectively, it's much more collaborative, you know, and, and the you, designer can approach it just like a product manager or an engineer or a data scientist is not, it's not uh, limiting by, you know, the amount function. of expertise retire, required. Yeah. Or function. Um, and it really kind of helps you build the foundation for this larger data analysis problem or instrumentation problem where you're like, Oh, where should we spend our time? It because it's very easy does. to be like instrument at all. It's like, yeah. well, how much of it is actually useful for my, what I need, which is to really understand what people are doing. Yeah, that's right. You don't want noise. You want it's it's like if 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 you're if you're going through a product flow, um, there are going to be a, a key set of of interactions that you really care about, whether or not they're happening. The other thing that I really love about it is that um, understanding the product flow is a full team effort. Um, you're not going to build an amazing digital product if you're throwing things over the wall across functions right. and um, if you're like oh we're just going to hire a data resource right to figure out what the hell we built later that that's not a great way to build a digital product and and so what's great about it also is that you get like a jay you're saying you get product management design engineering you get folks a subset of folks from all the functions in the room to just reason about what are we building together and what's great about that is that we all have blind spots I, as an engineer, I have tons of blind spots. Product management has blind spots. Design has blind spots. And what's beautiful is that when you get that whole set of people in a room together and map out a flow together, it's not easy. But when you do it, here's the other thing that's funny about it to me, the whole process, is you mm -hmm. think think about like a common thing you do in, in Spotify. And probably your friends and families do it too. And then grab, grab a few of them, had a whiteboard, and just map out. What does the user do? How does the app respond? What does the user do next? How does the app respond? And which of these interactions should we track as, as an event? Um, it seems so easy, but you sit back and you watch folks try to map out just the, the simplest high level description of what's happening. And surprisingly, it's not easy. I, you know, It reminds me of like uh, being in the Bay Area before moving to Texas watching Steph Curry come up as part of the Golden State Warriors basketball team. And he's just amazing, but he, he wasn't early on. And it's like, he's, he's smaller, he's an incredible outside shooter. And the, the reason why he's such an incredible outside shooter is because he's able to open up space between him and defenders. And he's able to open up space because he spent, I don't even know how much time working on crazy dribbling with both hands. Right. and and other things and and so i think what's interesting with event storming also is like 
teams, whether it's a product manager, a designer, an engineer, folks want to jump to their their glory effort. Like an engineer wants to jump right into the code, a designer wants to jump right into Figma, a PM wants to jump right to like, you know, the 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 ship announcement. And none of these folks really want to just figure out at a base level, okay, what's the flow that we're building yeah. with enough detail that we can build it right. And so what I love about event storming is that it it brings you back to it it helps you with, I think, necessary alignment and discipline. Hundred percent. It's a great tool. Okay, so we've built this foundation with event storming, really kind of defining our events. We implement them. Let's assume all that goes yeah. well. Then you start getting into um, analysis. And um, oftentimes that can be done with like a data scientist. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's done self-service with tools like Amplitude and Mixpanel. Yeah, you know, things that you and I are very familiar with that are that are that are wonderful. Um, what are some of the common pitfalls you see with teams or PMs using self-service analytics? Um, you know, they get access to something like Amplitude and Mixpanel. They're ready to go. Yeah. They're at the beginning of that journey. Like, what do you see people often uh, not quite get right about using those types of products? I th I think that what I see most often is um, is avoidance, <laughs> and not like not just from PMs, but from engineers, from from everyone, data science, like from everyone. I think I think is avoidance. I think that uh, like you go to most companies, and there will be some dashboard that someone put together three years ago, and they're no longer at the company, and all the critical business decisions are being made on this dashboard and people don't even really understand where the data is coming from or why. And again, this goes back to the fact that we as humans, uh, you know, we, we look around, it's like, what, what dashboard is everyone else looking at? Oh, I'll look at that one. And, mm. and so I, so I think that's the, the, the biggest challenge with, um, with actually digging and understanding your product flow and actually identifying with your teammates, what are the key facts you want to record? And then, capturing those as events and then actually going and look and building and looking at funnels is, is we, you know, we, we, we don't want to do the work, mm -hmm. unfortunately. And oftentimes we're in organizations where uh, we're working in, in, in companies where there is not an expectation or habits around people working that way. Right. And so I, so I think that, but I, I think it's an opportunity. And so I think that we're not going to be perfect. And I avoid things a lot of the time too. Um, but I think that like a superpower for a PM or developer or for anyone in, in a company building digital products is that if you, can, uh, if you can avoid this part of the job a little bit less than everyone else, you're gonna be so much more effective and so much more, uh, you're gonna have so much more conviction about what to work on and why. Well said. Yeah, it kind of gets back to that point that you were making earlier about curiosity. Yeah. Like having that lack of curiosity can be really detrimental. Yeah. Especially when you're starting out, you're getting your hands on these tools. You don't quite know, you know, the underlying technology. Yeah. You might assume that everybody else knows. Um, but they don't. But that's the wrong assumption. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, they don't. It's like it really pays to... Uh, it really pays to just, you know, pull a Steve Jobs, embrace beginner's mind. I don't know. You're going to figure it out. You're going to be like, if, if you just, if you just put the shame and the fear aside and just dive in before you know it, you're going to be the, the expert. We made it to the end. I am like two beers in I can barely <laughs> feel my face, but I feel like I've learned so much. You probably melted it off. I don't even know. <laughs> you know, one a, a final parting thought that I think is yeah, really please. interesting about about metrics is, um, and this also goes back to curiosity, is that it's interesting to me that a lot of companies um, very quickly turn metrics into a goal, which isn't a bad thing, right? Um, but they'll say, okay, we have a metric and we want it to be 5% higher or, or whatever it is. What I think is unfortunate is that 
again, this goes back to human nature and gamifying, um, is that I believe that the real superpower in a metric is that it lets you get answers to a question about the state of that part of reality yeah. that is believable. That Ray Dalio, uh, this, this guy, this investor, wrote this book, uh, Principles, a few years ago. And he has a lot of good principles in that. But one of the principles, like, I'm going to get this wrong, but in essence, he says, be careful who you ask questions to because you're going to get an answer. <laughs> you will, yeah. right? Yeah. And it's like, um, I mean, <laughs> like I have two kids growing up. They're like, hey, dad, how does this work? Why does this happen? And, um, you know, I've, <laughs> I've probably given some not very believable answers. And I think that's true of everyone. And so you think about like your life at work and about how many questions are going to various people and think about the believability of the answers that are coming back. And oftentimes the believability of the answers is not that high, right? Mm -hmm. And so what I think is really amazing about metrics, and this goes back to event storming and like really thinking about for our product, we could measure a bunch of random garbage and noise, but what are the, what are the actual two or three things that we really care about understanding? Like how many, how many playlists are people creating, right? Uh, whatever it is, right? Um, once you have defined a metric that measures that, you can ask questions about how much that's happening or for what users is it happening or what time of day is it happening? Like you can start to ask all these questions and you can actually get believable answers back. Yeah. Right. Which it's is the closest amazing. you can get to like, it's the closest God you can get mode. to a super yeah, superpower. God it's mode. It's God mode. Yeah. But the but the, really the, the but the key thing, and I think this often gets lost with metrics, is that a metric should be about letting you ask questions. And as soon as a metric becomes a goal, oftentimes teams stop using it to ask questions and start using it right to just show green or whatever. Mm. Mm -hmm. So that you don't, they're, they're, you know, they're not asking a question anymore. And John Cutler, this wonderful, um, this wonderful guy at Amplitude right now, he, he had a write up recently about vanity metrics and, um, and it's like, think about a metric and think about what happens when it goes up. Do people celebrate? Okay, cool. What happens when it goes down? Like what actually happens when it goes down? And if nothing actually happens when it goes down, that's a vanity metric. Yeah. It's not being used to actually ask questions that inform how we change our actions and how we change what we're building. It's, it's being used to basically not avoid doing work. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, man. It's true. It's totally so, true. Yeah. So it's like with all these things, with, with controlled experimentation, with, uh, with event storming and instrumenting our products like the, I think with all these things, it, it's funny cause it, it comes back to where you started us. Like the, the principles for being a great PM, I think are not very different from the principles for being a great engineer or engineering leader. And I think it comes down to curiosity and humility, right? Like the humility to say, I actually don't understand how the universe works. Mm -hmm. but I am curious to know and I'm willing to do the work to find out. And to do that, I'm going to map out the product flow with my, with my friends and, and neighbors, and I'm going to find parts that I want to change. And I'm going to change those with experiments. And then as I get data and make observations and just reason about customers, right? drink beer together with, with, with a J and, and think like, Oh, what, what, what cool thing can we do next in the product? Um, and then yeah. go after that with conviction and courage. Like if, if you get those things together, um, you're going to be in a good spot. Work's going to be a lot of fun, man. Be humble, be curious, go after it with conviction and courage. What a way to bring us home, man. That's, <laughs> uh, that's wonderful. Well, Dude, it's always a pleasure to talk with you. I'm so glad we got the chance to got a chance to do this. Me too. Um, I'm glad we get to share a lot of what you and I have shared over the years. We've been on a journey together, else. man. Yeah, God, we have. we've learned a lot together. We have, 
and I'm glad we get to share it with everybody. And uh, thank you for being on, man. Thanks for having me. Cheers to you. Um, where can people find you? If they have questions for you, want to connect, want to learn Let's more see. about kind of stuff you're working on? Probably the best. The best place for me right now is just LinkedIn, I think. All right. Well, bombard Seth here with lots of LinkedIn connections. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, he's, he's wonderful. And I hope you all enjoyed the podcast and we'll uh, we'll talk soon. Thanks everybody. And thank you, Seth. Appreciate it. Thank you so much, Jay. And that's a wrap. What a guy that Seth Hodgson, huh? We covered PM fundamentals, experimentation, instrumentation, the works. So many great nuggets in there. Let us know if you enjoyed this interview in the comments at our website for the episode and if there are any guests you'd love to hear from on the show. Thank you, as always, for joining us for Product Happy Hour. If you enjoyed Happy Hour today, please support us by subscribing at our website, www.producthappyhour.com. There are two options, as I mentioned earlier, $5 a month and $30 a year. For a Starbucks latte a month or one DoorDash order a year, you can help us keep this party going and keep ads off the pod. Thank you in advance for your support. You can also support the show by following the show on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Please also rate the show on your platform of choice. really helps us out. Follow us on Instagram or TikTok for clips at Product Happy HR. And please share with your friends and spread the word. The more people at the bar, the merrier. Thank you so much for listening to the show, and we'll see you next time. Cheers. Cheers.